Ladies and gentlemen, you may have heard of this problem in video games. Now, some games are actually locked to a pretty low frame rate, and well, some people don't actually like that. So what they do is they find some tool or modification that actually unlocks the frame rate. However, when they do this, they notice another problem. The whole game with the unlocked frame rate is now going either faster or slower than before. What that means is things like game physics, you know, everything is now going at say double the speed. What exactly is going on here? What does frame rate have to do with the speed in which the game actually runs? As it turns out, this is a very interesting question. And in fact, if you are a programmer and you're working with any sort of interactive system, well, this will become your problem at one point of time or another. Of course, to understand this, we have to understand the basics from the ground up. So yeah, that's what we're gonna explore today on another episode of 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. So today's video is going to come to you in three parts. We're going to begin by understanding, well, what the issue is in the first place. And by that, we'll actually explore the concept of a main loop or an events loop. We'll look at a very simple implementation of the events loop. And by just staring hard enough at it, we'll realize what the problems are. We'll then try to talk about, you know, how we can actually address these issues so that, well, the bad things don't happen. So yeah, that's our roadmap for today. Without further ado, let us jump into our very first part. Now, let's begin with the basics. Here's the deal. Most programs don't just start, do their stuff, and then terminate. In fact, most programs, you know, especially those with some measure of interactivity, will start and then move to a waiting stage for the user to actually give input. When a user gives input, well, the program responds and then goes back into a waiting state, once again waiting for the next piece of input. The program only terminates when we tell it to, and what that means is we have to somehow implement that waiting stage in the middle. For more complex programs like games, there is also one more thing it needs to do, and that is while waiting for user input, it is actually constantly performing some sort of computation. As you can imagine, you'll need this in a game because, well, things in a game will continue advancing doing whatever they are doing, even if the user is not actually supplying input. So for games, that is one more thing we have to think about as well. So of course the question is, how do we actually implement this? Well, to actually explore this idea, let's take a look at a very simple program. Our program looks something like this, and basically, well, there are three big buttons. So all we have to do is write some code that, well, allows our buttons to work correctly. As you can imagine, our program at, you know, the simplest level of abstraction looks something like this. We just need to draw the entire GUI once and then prepare to handle the input. Of course, if we were to just write it this way, the moment we actually take one piece of input, the entire program just ends. So that's not very useful. What we have to do instead is to actually create a while loop. As long as the user hasn't quit, we want to be looping indefinitely here and basically wait for any number of events that the user has actually input. The full implementation will probably look something like this. If a particular button has been pressed, run the function associated with that button. So yeah, we have if statements repeated three times for each one of the buttons. So that's how you implement an events loop. Of course, in this case, events refer to any form of user input, be it typing keys on a keyboard, moving your mouse, or clicking on something. For a program that is more complex, like say a multiplayer game, an event may also include something like, well, something you receive over the network. For example, some other player actually moving, and that causes a packet to be sent to you, and that could be processed as an event as well. Of course, in order to process as many events as there are coming in, you'll need a loop to do this constantly. As mentioned, for a more complex application like a game, you'll probably also want to do some amount of computation while you're waiting. Really, this doesn't change up our code very much as you can see. We just need to do one more thing in our event loop, and that is to advance you know, our game world one step forward each time. 
so far so good. We've actually, you know, addressed the main problem we have, but because we're using an extremely simplified solution, well, there are some further problems. Let's go back to our very basic example. I'll show you a case in which we can actually cause the whole program to just grind to a halt. Let's consider what will happen if I were to click on the Generate Report button. Of course, if I were to do that, well, in the loop, the Generate Reports function will be run. Now, normally this is a process that could take some time. So imagine if we're actually stuck on Generate Reports for a while, it is not going through the entire loop. In fact, the events loop has ground to a halt at this statement. Since we're not looping, we're not able to actually check to see if any of the other buttons are being pressed. And as a result, at this point of time, if I were to try and click on anything at all, the program is actually unresponsive. In the game example, this could be an even greater problem. Let's say now, you know, we have some very slow graphics hardware, and as a result, draw screen takes a lot of time. What this means of course is that, well, we have the same issue as we've seen just now. There will be a responsiveness issue because handle user input is not run very often. What's even worse is, the whole game actually slows down because, well, draw screen is bogging down this loop, this loop doesn't happen very often, and as a result, game state isn't advanced very often. As a result, the whole game actually slows down and could grind to a halt if draw screen takes too long. There's of course another issue associated with doing things this way. In fact, if we were to use an infinite while loop to do some kind of computation, we run into several problems. The first of which is that, well, a fast computer will run this operation more times than a slow computer. This is because, well, this runs as quickly as a computer can run it. The moment it's done doing this statement, it's going to just pop back up and go and do it again. A slow computer takes more time to do this, and as a result, runs this function less times per second than a fast computer can. In addition to this, even if we're talking about the same computer, well, if it's on a day in which that computer is bogged down, you know, by say other processors or by, I don't know, a memory leak, what's going to happen is, in those conditions, it's going to be able to run this code less often. So really, doing things this way creates many inconsistencies. You basically have no clue whatsoever as to how quickly your program runs. It's never consistent, not even on the same computer. These inconsistencies can actually create a lot of other problems. For example, in some cases, your program can actually run very slowly, and in a case of the game, it could actually cause the game to slow down and speed up erratically. Now that we know what a problem is, of course, we need a fix. Unfortunately, as it turns out, the simplest fix to this sounds pretty complex. We'll have to actually do multi-threading. Multi-threading is actually quite simple to explain on paper, even though it is more challenging to you know, implement and implement correctly. So yeah, let's just take a look at you know, the very broad idea of how multi-threading can help us. The whole point of the multi-threading approach is to run the different operations on different threads. The reason why we do this is to actually rely on the operating system to switch between these threads. We can picture these threads as running in parallel, and as a result, one thread can never bog down another. Let's take a closer look at how and why this works. Once again, we start with our very simple program. When any one of these buttons are actually clicked, we do the respective function, but in a new thread. What this means is even if we run something very slow like the generate report function, well, that's going on in its own thread. This particular line terminates immediately and we can actually go back into our loop and wait for some other user input while the generate report function is actually running in the background. We can actually picture this with a pretty simple diagram we have our main thread, which is actually what you see here. This is the contents of the main thread, and all it does is handle and dispatch events. It doesn't actually do the heavy lifting of actually responding to the event itself. It just creates a new thread and get that new thread to do it. Case in point, let's say the user clicks on generate reports. All it does is dispatch a new thread that generates the report, and it can actually continue to, well, do whatever it needs to do. 
Now, if we were to actually expand upon the responsibilities of the main thread to let it do GUI as well, what we can do is we can actually have something like a progress bug. Then what we can do is we have the generate report thread constantly report back and cause the progress bar to move forward. This of course creates a very responsive design and no point of time will the program just sit there and appear to do nothing. Of course, at the end of the day, when the report has been finished, it's going to terminate and send its results back to the main thread. And that is how you can actually, well, show the results to the user. Of course, this is just one way of doing things. In a case of the game, well, we can do things in a slightly different manner. And that is, everything important is actually run in its own thread. And the main thread only has the responsibility of spawning all these threads and basically sitting there and just waiting until the program has been quit. Of course, this doesn't say a lot about you know, any potential timing issues, so let's take a closer look at how we can actually resolve that problem. What we do is we actually run the game logic at a consistent interval. This gives us a very clear idea of how often the game logic actually advances, and as a result, we are very sure about how quickly the game runs. To sort of make this idea clearer, think of it this way. If I want to actually advance the game logic 20 times a second, then the interval in which I call this function is a 50 millisecond interval. This is of course based on a real life example. Minecraft actually, well, forwards the game logic 20 times per second. And every one of these advanced functions is actually known as a tick. Of course, this isn't very descriptive. The proper way we will want to do this is to actually do some kind of time comparison. These are just operations to help us actually compute how much time has passed and yeah, we compute an interval and check to see if it exceeds a threshold. We'll only run the game logic if it has. For the other functions, well, to actually draw the game, we can either give it a consistent interval to sort of lock the frame rate to any known value, or if we don't want to do that, then simply loop this as quickly as possible. This will cause your computer to basically redraw the screen as often as it possibly can. Same deal for the input loop, since it's running on its own, we want it to run as quickly as possible and handle as many inputs as it possibly can. As mentioned, some advantages of this method is that, well, now the game logic isn't running at full speed, and that actually makes it less prone to issues. It is no longer easy to affect it with factors like processor speed, or other issues like other threads actually bogging down the processor. Since we lock it to run at a particular interval that is actually, you know, spaced apart a reasonable amount, we can generally assume that, you know, it will meet the correct speed. In addition, because all the operations are separated, what that means is they can each run at whatever speed they have to run at and not affect the other operations. To go to our diagram, as you can imagine, well, it looks something like this. The game logic runs at its own speed, the rendering runs at its own speed, and the input handling runs as fast as possible, so as to capture as much input as it possibly can. What's cool about this is that even if you know something slows down, say your game world gets extremely complex and your computer can't quite handle all the logic, the other things may still continue at their full speed without being bogged down by the process that is becoming slow. And there you go, that is the importance of multi-threading in building any program that has any form of GUI. The unfortunate reality is this could be quite hard to do. It's not easy to get these threads to talk to each other correctly, especially because, you know, they're doing their own things at their own speeds. This problem is known as synchronization, and simply put, it is a can of worms. We are quite out of time today, which is why I'm not really going into that topic. But if there is interest, do let me know in the comments below and I'll try to see what I can do. The difficulty in actually implementing synchronization is the reason why some games just don't do it. They find ways to work around this issue and in some cases, they do get away with it. As mentioned earlier, a frame rate lock is one way of doing this. If you actually you know, restrict your frame rate to a particular value, then you have some consistency as to how often everything occurs and you can then lock your game logic to the same speed. There are more examples of this, say Saints Row 2, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Well, that game was written for one of the Xbox consoles, 
and some of it is actually locked to the clock speed of the Xbox processor. That is all well and good because it's an Xbox game. The clock speed of the Xbox processor, you know, is a known constraint. It is something that we know for sure. So if we want to tie something to that value, that's not too much of a problem. The problem comes in when that game is actually ported to PC. That is the platform I played it on, and my clock speed isn't anywhere near the clock speed of the Xbox. This is when you get a lot of crazy problems, even cutscenes don't play at the right speed, and everything just gets real messy. So yeah, maybe you can get away with not doing the multi-threading approach, but well, that is if and only if you know for sure the constraints are not going to change. When you move out of those constraints, well, the problem's gonna come back to bite you. Anyway, that's all the risk for this random Wednesday episode. I hope you've gained some insight today, but yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.